Hey YouTube, Mr. Terry back here once again for another History Teacher Reacts video. Today I'm going to be wrapping up Extra History's series on Genghis Khan. I'm going to be watching two of their videos today, video number five and video number six. It was a six-part series, and um, if you have not seen my previous reaction videos to this series, um, I would suggest you do that uh, first. There will be links to the videos down below. Um, I did one video covering episodes one and two, a video doing three and four, and like I just said, this will be five and six so this is wrapping up their series so all right well um before we begin just want to make sure and plug the original content creators if you like the original video here there'll be a link uh, down below so you can go see the original video um, and give them a like and subscribe give them the credit of course that they deserve and uh, if you haven't subscribed to our channel here um, if you're new to the channel the idea of a history teacher watching history videos that's appealing to you love to have you subscribe and see you hopefully in um, future episodes as well. All right, well, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So this one is titled Beginnings of the Great Mongol Nation. So where we had kind of left off is basically Genghis has um, defeated most of the rivals now, and especially the major ones. And he's at the point where he is now just, I guess, trying to unify basically what's what's kind of left there and, and the big thing is that that has really not happened in mongol history um very few times have the mongol tribes been united you've had these competing cons these competing tribes so he ha now has kind of the uh the job to try to keep them unified and remember too that he's a very different ruler than a lot of the cons um as he's brought in so many different people of different uh, aspects and tried to make equality amongst people um so this is a different task altogether and i guess i'm hoping here that they teach a little bit more about how that actually came to be. All right, talking too much, let's go ahead and get going with the video here. One year after defeating his greatest rival, Temujin Khan summoned the greatest and most important Kurultai in Mongolian history. After many days of ceremony and ritual and many nights of celebration, Temujin is elected Khan of all Mongols yep. and chooses a new title for himself. Genghis Khan. She's dropping the original name completely. Right, universal kind of ruler here. Much bigger scale with uh, the At name the age now he's of 45, getting. Genghis Khan controlled a vast territory and over one million souls. His domain stretched from a lot the of Gobi people for a region. South to the Arctic tundra in the north, from the Manchurian forests in the east to the Altai Mountains to the west. He named his new people the Great Mongol Nation. He abolished inherited aristocratic titles, right. criminalized the abduction or enslavement of any Mongol, forbade the selling and kidnapping of women, declared all children born of Mongol parents to be legitimate, and made livestock theft punishable by death. He ordered the adoption of a writing system, conducted a census, and instituted diplomatic immunity and freedom of religion, exempting all religious leaders and their property from taxation and public service. Eventually, he extended this tax exemption to anybody who provided essential public services, including undertakers, doctors, lawyers, teachers, and scholars. With the nomadic tribes united and Genghis Khan established as their leader, his next step wasn't clear. He had spent so many years locked in conflict with Jamaka and Ong Khan that now his right. enormous tribe lacked a mission. So he turned his gaze beyond the steppe and engaged in a series of raids against the Tangut Empire in what Okay. Um before we continue on, remember what the what the things that is making uh, Genghis so different. Um a lot of that originates from his background. Um he was uh, family pretty pretty regular, you know, as far as that goes, um, as far as social status goes. Whereas other Mongol tribes, um, a lot of them had been built upon aristocracy, that there was a, an, a, a much more of an elite class, and that usually their leadership came through that and got, you know, specific privileges. And what has even brought Genghis up to this point is his ability to gain support. Um, and his support didn't come from rival aristocrats. Um, it came from their subject peoples, uh, because what he would do is basically they would fight. And of course, they're extremely brutal, right? And basically destroy the their leaders there. Thus, not having those people, they don't have anyone to have any remaining loyalty to, and promise them that he could they could join his tribe, and rather not rather as like captives, slaves, like captives of war, but if they um, would 
you know, be loyal, they could join and be considered equals amongst the others. And especially with this, considering everybody is kind of Mongol um, at this point, then that's a little bit easier. Now, what's going to be an interesting thing here later is when you start see them invading uh, non-Mongols, right? And how are they going to treat those people? How are they going to treat the foreigners? And they went off just a second ago here and listed a whole bunch of the things about his empire, about tax exemption and uh, to for for services and uh, the uh, freedom of religion. Right? They did not impose. Uh, their religion on others. In fact, you know, not to go into too much detail about Mongol religion, but um, Mongol religion is much more tired to the environment they came from, um, rather than a lot of these other like doctrinal teachings and some of those other things. So it wasn't really something that was really almost even possible to spread their religion. So it was never an issue anyways. Um, and in fact, during a lot of the, the these Mongol empires, a lot of them, um, their leaders took great pride in that they had a lot of different people, of a lot of different religions in the empire and even giving them different uh, higher statuses. And I think, you know, these cons, especially as the successful ones, want to have that message in their ear coming from all types of different uh, backgrounds of their of their empire and in that you become more educated about your empire self and then it's it's better to run that way so again you're seeing this kind of built upon what he believe, I, I believes is i guess is treating people well within his empire but of course the great thing that people talk about is it's like it doesn't seem like that bad living in the mongol empire but you do not want to get in their way um you would much rather join them than try to defeat them because if you fight back or you resist or and those sort of things then you saw what the mongol fury has been famous for and notorious for for history um so i think a lot of people are realizing that now uh as as they're continuing to grow in um promise under uh, genghis it is now western china Unlike the nomadic steppe tribes, the Tangut had walled cities, moats, and fortresses. This is different than anything they fought were before. were nearly twice the size of Genghis Khan's. In these campaigns, he had to adopt new methods of warfare to adapt to these conditions. He quickly learned classic siege techniques, such as cutting off his enemy's food supply, but soon began experimenting with new tactics. On one raid, he attempted to divert a nearby river to flood the city. Despite scant experience in engineering, the Mongols did succeed in diverting the wow. river, but they wiped out their own camp instead of the Tangut. Oh, they survived their mistake, fail. though, and went on to conquer the city. And with you know, besides that failure, when you see Genghis's military, um, uh, his, you know, his military going off and, and, and attacking places, it's it's almost like they never he never does the same thing twice. Like every battle was a unique thing that took. A specific type of tactic or innovation um, he's definitely one that tried a lot of new things he was open to using um, even like new technologies especially the mongols uh, later on importing other technologies but yeah it's like everything was strategized for that battle and they they were good at adjusting and that's probably why they were so successful too but something they they talked about which is very important is the mongols don't really live in in, in uh, walled cities so now as they're expanding they are facing walled cities and this is a completely different set of challenges because they're about open ba uh, uh um field battles not siege warfare and that's a, again a very different thing i mean walls have been the you know for for human history the the best defense possible at least until the uh, eventual era of the expansion of gunpowder and cannons which really made a lot of these kind of castle structures and things obsolete but this is where you have to see a new type of uh, warfare that mongols are not used to instead of the tangut they survived their mistake though and went on to conquer the city and with every siege, the Mongols would learn and eventually become experts at devastating enemy cities. Until this point, not many people outside of Mongolia had taken much notice of the upstart barbarian chief or his newly proclaimed nation. This was about to change. Yeah. In 1210, when Genghis Khan was 48, the Jurchid nation sent a delegation from their capital city of Zhengdu, where modern-day Beijing now lies. Ong Khan had previously sworn allegiance to them, so now they came to demand the submission of Genghis Khan. Upon hearing this order, That's, Genghis Khan no. turned in the direction of their nation to the south, spat on the ground, unleashed <laughs> a line of insults, and then mounted his horse and yeah. rode north. You do not tell Genghis what to do. You do not determine the terms of the treaty. Um, he is so full of confidence that 
it's not going to happen. It doesn't matter if that's what, how things were going before with previous Mongol tribes. No. So that's so she like spits on their ground. Like, this is what I think of your land. You know what I mean? Um, so now that you've pissed him off, I think you know it's about probably about to happen. Leaving the stunned envoy choking in his dust, their nation to the south spat on the ground, unleashed a again. line of insults, and then mounted his horse and rode north. I wonder what the, the Mongol the insults envoy are. Choking in his dust. The Mongol army advanced to the south, sending squads of soldiers ahead to scout for decent pasture, seek out water sources, and report on weather conditions. They always do their homework raids first. in the Tangut Empire turned out to be a perfect practice for their campaign against their Jurchid neighbors. Desert crossings and siege warfare were now solved problems. And the Mongols had another surprising advantage. Their diet. Traditional armies traveled in long columns with massive supply trains. The Mongols, in contrast, spread out over a vast area to provide sufficient pasture for their animals, and each warrior hunted for himself or carried his own individual supplies. Makes sense. Dispersed, They're hunter-gatherers, the basically. The strict decimal organization system was diligently enforced, such that each unit, with its own doctors and commanders, always knew where to report and how to find what they needed. And because most of the Mongol army was illiterate and communication across such a large area was critical, the officers came up with a novel solution. Orders were composed in rhyme to ensure that messages were easily memorized and repeated to each new person exactly <laughs> you sang as they the orders, were right? spoken. The Mongols also That's launched brilliant. propaganda campaigns to break the spirit of the Jurchid people, claiming that the Mongols were coming as a liberating force to free them from the oppressive royal family. More than a few Jurchids defected to join him. In the end, they found victory by transforming the Jurchids' greatest asset, their large population, into a weakness. They terrorized the countryside and conscripted local peasants, clearing out all the surrounding villages before turning their sights to the larger cities, okay, using peasants sense. as human shields. Rounding up an enemy's herds and stampeding them toward their owner's battle lines was a traditional step tactic, but the Mongols <laughs> modified this old classic by using enemy peasants instead, attacking and burning undefended villages and sending terrified peasants fleeing in all directions, clogging highways and making it difficult for the Jurchid supply caravans to move. Over the course of the campaign, more than one million refugees fled the countryside and poured into the cities, causing chaos and food shortages. The Jurchid military ended up executing tens of thousands. It it's almost like they're winning the war before the wars even started. Like before they're even fighting them, they've already like achieved these massive advantages, right? And creating chaos. And by the time they 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 sh are going to show up, it's like things are way softened up now. Um, turning their people against them in a way, and all these tactics. So yeah, they're winning the war before the war. Let's go back about five seconds. Chaos and food shortages. The Jurchid military ended up executing tens of thousands of their own people just to maintain enough food stores to feed their armies. Jeez. During this campaign, Genghis Khan discovered that Chinese engineers had developed powerful machines to batter city walls from afar. To adapt these massive war machines to fit his mobile army, he began hosting a corps of engineers on every campaign, who would camp in the forests close to target cities and cut down enough wood to build siege engines on the spot. In 1214, despite yep. some difficulties adapting to the hot, damp climate, Genghis Khan finally besieged the capital city of Chengdu. The Jurchid had endured so much strife by then that they quickly agreed to a settlement rather than face a prolonged siege. Very common In return against them. For Mongol withdrawal, the Jurchid leader, known as the Golden Khan, swore allegiance to Genghis Khan and offered massive amounts of silk, silver, gold, horses, and people. As soon as the Mongols left, however, the Golden Khan and his entire royal court fled, hoping to get far enough away to escape the reach of the Mongol army. Ooh. Genghis Khan saw this as a breach of their agreement and sure. returned to sack the capital. This time, Genghis Khan offered no opportunity to negotiate. They looted the city according to the new Mongol law. They took absolutely everything, inventoried it, and distributed it amongst the army. That's the other thing I think you're going to find out too. If the Mongols are going to cut you a deal, you take it and you don't do anything to jeopardize that deal or anything like that. And because you're you're lucky in a lot of these cases that 
uh, you get you often get your chance with the Mongols before the battle begins. They'll give you your chance, um, offer something in return. Well, again, a lot of it's tribute, like they were saying here. But to have one like during the war, because a lot of times when that happened, if you turned them down, they were not. That was it. That the negotiations were going to be done. You were going to get just obliterated. But yeah, being able to have a deal that to stop it before you're completely destroyed was already pretty uh, uh, a fortunate thing for them to have. And then make the Mongols doubt it by bailing and all that stuff. Yeah, they they shot themselves in the foot and ended up. Uh, yeah, you saw what happened. They took absolutely everything, inventoried it, and distributed it amongst the army. As a final punishment, as the Mongol warriors retreated to their homeland, they churned up the earth behind them and trampled it with their horses. Genghis Khan wanted to ensure that the peasants never returned to their fields. Besides, this way he could convert the land to open pasture, both to feed his newly captured livestock and to allow easier access in future campaigns in the region. Right. But in the years that Genghis Khan had been raiding abroad, trouble had begun to brew at home. Oh. Some of his most steadfast followers, the Muslim Uyghurs of the desert oases, supported him so strongly that other Uyghurs living further to the west in modern-day Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan wished to overthrow their Buddhist rulers mm. and join Genghis Khan as well. Mm. Some sent envoys to Mongol lands seeking an alliance, but others were under the control of Kuchlug, the son of the Naiman Khan who had harbored Jamaka. In his new position of power, okay. Kuchlug began to persecute his Muslim subjects, forbidding the call to prayer, public worship, or Muslim religious yeah, study. Not go Without well a Genghis, ruler though. to protect them, the Muslim Uyghurs turned to Genghis Khan to overthrow their oppressor. Yeah. Although the Mongol army was thousands of miles away, Genghis Khan sent 20,000 soldiers under the command of one of his generals to defend the Muslims. And because they were engaging in this campaign at the request of their allies, this time they did not raid or loot the capital city, yeah, no but point. instead simply defeated the army, beheaded Kuchlug, and returned home, leaving behind a herald to proclaim the restoration of religious freedom in the- So that, think of the bonus points or whatever, that that just won with the uh, Muslim groups over there, right? He has just been now their liberator, a non-Muslim, right? That's fighting for them and to protect their ability to uh, practice their religion. Um, that's going to create a, a very powerful alliance right there. And returned home, leaving behind a herald to proclaim the restoration of religious freedom in the land. Most importantly to Genghis Khan, this victory ensured Money. complete control over the Silk Road between the Chinese and the Ching. Muslims. Although he didn't control the Sung Dynasty, where silk was produced, or the primary purchasing areas in the Middle East, he rerouted the twisting channels of the Silk Road into one large stream over the course of his campaign, and directed it through the Mongol steppes. Smart. So much Smart. silk passed through his land that the Mongols even started using it as a packing material. Suddenly, life on the steppe looked very different than it had before. Rawhide ropes were exchanged for silk cords. Fur and leather clothes were replaced with robes embroidered in silver and gold. Yurts were decorated with silk rugs, pillows, and blankets. Perfume, makeup, jewelry, board games, paper fans, incense, honey, wine, and tea became commonplace. The, so the Silk Road, of course, is famous. It had been going on for, for millennia. Um, and the Mongols were smart in understanding how important it was to, uh, to protect the Silk Roads, right? It was their, it was their economy. Um, they're, they're the middlemen between East Asia and then like Central and West Asia. And then of course, moving on to Europe and so many luxury goods are there and they understood how important it was also to protect those. They had incredibly strict laws on banditry and piracy and those things that help protect that. There was a, a, a famous saying I had heard one time that you could walk the Silk Road during the Mongol Empire, the golden plate on your head, and not have to worry about being robbed uh, because they, again, they were so protective of, of that. Another interesting thing I've, I've heard about them is um, they understood silk, you know, since it's named, the Silk Road's named after the, the silk, which is the big product that's been a big continuity of trade materials on the Silk Road. But they also under, they understood 
especially um, later on, by the way, when they are in control of China. So they're in control more of where the silk actually comes from. That's going to come later on with his grandson, Kublai Khan, who finishes off the uh, conquest of China, but understood how important silk was. And also, really importantly, wanted to make sure that the secret of silk stays with them, because that is something the Chinese have always tried to protect. Um, now, we know today how it is, but it was mysterious for ever centuries and centuries right um of course we know now it comes from a worm and it's a very very complex process um but they actually had like a law that um you could not smuggle out like silkworms right you couldn't you couldn't smuggle them out and, and let those secrets out because if they lose their monopoly on silk and then silk making process um, is begun in other places in the world they're going to lose their monopoly and once you lose your monopoly you use the all the um much of the economic benefits right that come from that so and the the penalty for that will of like you know like smuggling out like like uh, silkworms or something um could very well be death they just they just draw a very clear line there all right we've got about a minute or so left of this episode let's go ahead and continue paper fans, incense, honey, wine, and tea became commonplace. Skilled artisans, scholars, and entertainers from across Genghis Khan's empire contributed their art, science, and culture to Mongol society. The Muslims in the region, from the mountains of modern Afghanistan to the Black Sea, produced steel, the finest of all metals, as well as cotton and glass. Genghis Khan wanted these Very novel luxuries right? also. He sent ambassadors to the Sultan with gifts, approaching not as a conqueror, but as an ally, seeking an equal trade agreement. Smart. With great suspicion, the Sultan accepted. Genghis Khan sent hundreds of merchants from his newly acquired territories in caravans laden with goods to trade. As soon as the caravan entered their territory, however, a local official seized the goods and killed the merchants, Ooh. completely unaware of the incredible mistake. You know how they're going to respond to this. When Genghis Khan heard of this, he sent envoys to the Sultan asking him to punish the man responsible for the attack. Give him a chance. Instead, the Sultan doubled down and killed some of the Mongol envoys, oh maiming the others and sending them back to the Khan. Genghis Khan was... Furious. Goodbye. So enraged was he by this insult that he withdrew once again to his sacred mountaintop to pray and decide on a course of action. After three days of contemplation, he descended with his intentions set. The Mongols were going to war. Oh, yes. This story is legendary right here. Sends a peaceful envoy to to talk right with the sultan muslim king over there try to create an alliance and then kills the messengers it's like he was going out of his way to try to be nice if you don't know about this story i'm not going to talk about it right now i'll let you see the the next video um but you should be expecting the worst probably <laughs> um I'll just say that for now. All right. I always want to jump in. This was a great episode. I want to jump in. So the next episode we're about to watch is um, their final episode. So we'll see how they kind of wrap him up. I'm also very interested because to see what extra history is going to do, um, kind of if it's anything like uh the series i watched before i've watched one other series from them now and that was on Catherine the great and on that last episode they just did a whole bunch of uh like uh just like aggrandizement and just uh and and a lot of just praise and just use and doing all this stuff and i'm i'm, I'm interested to see if they kind of do that what they they talk about him are they just going to go on a long thing of praise and admiration are they going to make sure to of course balance these things with also him being one of the most brutal violent people that's ever lived and how they're going to balance that cuz again with Catherine there was a lot of a lot of butt kissing and stuff like that, you know what I mean? Uh, with some of these characters, it's interesting because it, it, Genghis is such a different and polarizing figure um, for that. So let's hop over real quick and see how they wrap it up. Well into his middle age and with a mighty empire under his control, Genghis Khan's thoughts linger on what will happen to that the final empire after years. he dies. What will become of his family? What will become of the world he has worked so hard to shape? Okay. The 13th century. 
The Muslim lands of the Khwarezm Empire were the richest and most sophisticated in the world. Its citizens soared above their contemporaries in Europe, India, and China in astronomy, mathematics, agronomy, and many other yeah. fields. But because they stood higher, they had the furthest to fall. A hundred thousand Mongol horsemen stormed the Khwarezm cities. The Sultan of Khwarezm had four times as many soldiers, but the Mongol forces were terrifying. And they honored their promise of clemency to all who surrendered as strictly as they honored their promise of destruction to all who resisted. <laughs> cities fell one after another. Many surrendered without a fight. Others held out for a few days or weeks before falling. After defeating each city, Genghis Khan sent clerks to divide the civilian population by profession, including doctors, astronomers, judges, engineers, teachers, artisans, and religious leaders. They so what? Here's another thing that that the Mongols used to do. They had a, a very, a very much a respect for learned individuals, even though they they always appealed to the common man. They had, a, a, a again, a, a, a big respect for educated, elite, skilled people. And so, and what they would do too is they would get like some of these people, right? They, they, um, engineers, etc. Um, and then they would actually uh, kind of force them basically to move to a different part of the empire that needed somebody, right? So like they need engineers over to the east or they need administrators over there. Like later on, for example, when the Mongols take over China, they didn't trust the Chinese because they'd put up such a fight for a long time to trust them that they brought administrators over from basically the Persian empires who had a long history of successful administration and brought them over there. So they would move around these elite people to places that they thought that they were needed um, throughout there because they did respect them and respect their abilities judges, engineers, teachers, artisans, and religious leaders. They especially sought out people who spoke multiple languages. Despite all of their growth, wealth, and power, the Mongols still practiced no crafts themselves other yeah. than war, herding, and hunting. They're middlemen. All of the skilled work done in their growing <laughs> empire was done by the people they conquered. Right. They needed teachers as much as they needed riches. But one group in particular could expect no mercy from the Mongol forces. That group being the wealthy and the powerful. Under the chivalrous That's rules of warfare as practiced in Europe and the Middle East during the Crusades, um, the aristocrats were protected and kept as hostages to be ransomed. Oh. The Mongols had no use for such pleasantries. Get rid of them. To prevent future wars, they sought out and eliminated any yep. enemy aristocrats they could find. Aristocrats offered nothing. Um, remember, the aristocrats, too, is the powerful, wealthy people. They're also the ones that provide or constitute the biggest threat afterwards if you keep them around. Because if there's going to be a rebuilding and things like that, it's going to come through them. So getting rid of them also ensures that you're not going to have to deal with this tribe later on, right? Of value to the Mongols, enemy aristocrats they could find. Aristocrats offered nothing of value to the exactly. Mongols and were nothing the most but... likely to resist them successfully okay. in the future. By eliminating the aristocracy, they decapitated the social system of their enemies. As the 1220s rolled in, Genghis Khan was in his 60s, at the height of his power, with nothing and no one standing in his way. But despite his overwhelming success as a conqueror, he was really struggling as a father. Custom held that each son in a herding a lot family of kids. inherited some of their family's herd. Genghis Khan intended to instead offer each son a piece of his empire. However, he also needed to choose one son to be the next great Khan after he died. He summoned a family Kurultai to discuss the matter. His two eldest sons, Jochi and Chagatai, were tense and terse with one another. Ogade, his third son, arrived to the meeting slightly late and also slightly inebriated. Dude. Genghis Khan asked his eldest son, Jochi, to speak to first come to on an interview the matter drunk. of succession. In doing so, he emphasized Jochi's rank as his eldest son, implying he was the likely successor. Chagatai did not agree, and interrupted before Jochi could answer. Jochi lunged at his brother, and the two men started to fist fight. Genghis Khan broke up the fight and tearfully pleaded with his sons, begging them to understand how different things were before they were born, when nobody was safe. He ordered you guys them to have respect it so each good. other, but he knew that he Spoiled could not impose brats. a choice on them that would last after his death. They would have to find a compromise. After much discussion, the family decided that neither Chagatai nor Jochi should become their father's so heir, but instead throat. agreed that the role of successor should go to their the mellow, good-natured, and hard-drinking brother, Ogade. 
Genghis Khan then allotted his personal lands and herds to each son and separated Jochi and Chagatai, giving them kingdoms at far opposite ends of his territory. <laughs> this ordeal cast a pall over the remainder of the campaign. Genghis Khan was now keenly aware of how much work he needed to do to preserve the empire after Dude his wants to death. Retire. He had been so dogged in his pursuit of empire and unification that he'd neglected his family. He put much effort into trying to mend the relationship between his eldest sons. He assigned them jointly to a campaign, but neither brother could agree on what tactics to use. And because of their bickering, the campaign stretched on for six months, an unprecedented amount of time together, for a huh? Mongol siege. Eventually, they had no choice but to burn the city to the ground and flood it, destroying it utterly and leaving nothing to loot. So in 1222, the Mongol conquest reached the city of Multan in modern-day Pakistan. Genghis Khan had set his sights on northern India, the seat of silk production. Oh, yeah. Here, however, he faced yeah. a new enemy that stopped him in his tracks. As soon as the Mongols left the dry and cold mountainous regions, both warriors and horses never grew took, sick uh, never and took weak. India. The Mongol bows, which were so well adapted to the extreme cold and heat of the steppe, weakened in the damp air and right. lost their accuracy. The Mongols were forced to fall back and sustained massive casualties as they withdrew to the more familiar climate of Afghanistan. Right. So the the Mongols are known for their adaptability and can fight in virtually any place. But hot humidity was basically it. They could fight in the cold, they could fight in the heat, mountains, deserts and all that stuff. But yeah, they it's it's the jungles and stuff like that that they get stopped in as they go further south in India and towards like Vietnam and places like that where they stopped because um also with some of the thickly the, the thicker areas too it didn't make some of their their um because they're they're known for cavalry right their their horsemanship um horses didn't do well some of those in those climates i know um but something i didn't know now necessarily is how the f uh, efficiency of their bows changed with the humidity they were built for a, a more of an arid climate so that's something new I, I i learned there but yeah um so you're starting to see them their conquests slow down sustained massive casualties as they withdrew to the more familiar climate of Afghanistan. Despite this setback, they had succeeded in their goal of conquering the Khwarezm Empire, bringing Central Asia and much of the Middle East under Mongol control. To celebrate, Genghis Khan called for a fate that ended up being the largest hunt in history. His men cordoned off a massive area of territory, and tens of thousands of soldiers from different armies converged on the field from different directions. The hunt lasted for months, and was intended as more than a celebration. Genghis Khan also wanted to use it to mellow relations between his sons, and to end the campaign on a cooperative note. Okay. Upon returning home, the victorious Mongol army saw the fruits of their conquest. The nation had been utterly transformed. Girls who had spent their days milking goats and yaks were now wearing silk while their new servants performed menial labor for them. Elders who had never seen metal in their lives now cut meat with Damascus steel girded with mm. ivory hilts. They served yaks milk from silver bowls while their musicians Living sang it up. them. But Genghis <laughs> Khan was not built for this life. No. He didn't want to stop conquering, or maybe he couldn't stop conquering. He set out once again to campaign against the Tangut, the very first foreign nation he had conquered after his election as Great Khan. The Tangut had refused to offer troops for the Khwarezm invasion, a slight that could not stand. And establishing a base in the Tangut kingdom would offer a second chance at the Sung dynasty, a target he still coveted. And that is where Most Genghis Khan's story very suddenly and very mysteriously ends. What happened next remains something of a mystery. Some say that while traversing the Gobi to fight the Tangut, Genghis Khan stopped to catch some wild horses and was thrown from his mount, sustaining internal injuries. Some legends say that he was assassinated by a sex worker, struck by lightning, poisoned, or killed so we, by a magic we have, spell we have no cast idea. by the Tangut king. We got Heck, no idea. Marco Polo even reports in his book chronicling his time in the yeah, court of Kublai Marco Khan, uh, Genghis. Genghis Khan's grandson, that the great Khan was killed after taking an arrow to the knee. All that we know for sure right, is that Skyrim. just before the Mongol victory over the Tangut, Genghis Khan died quietly. A procession would have set out towards Mongolia with Genghis Khan's body on a simple cart. 
his horsehair spirit banner would have led the way, and behind the procession would have followed his horse with a loose bridle and an empty saddle. He was buried anonymously in the soil of his homeland, without a monument to mark his grave. Genghis Khan transformed Mongol warfare from a messy tribal raiding system into an intercontinental affair. Um, because it, it looked like they would have passed the point where they would have talked about it. There's an interesting story about, um, the, the, uh, uh, or potentially stories about where, like, Genghis Khan might even be buried, right? We have, we actually, we have no idea. We have these ideas about it, but, um, there's some interesting stories, though, about what it might what the what things might be like that maybe it was more it could be a more of an elaborate tomb th type thing but one of the story one of the stories uh, says though is um it was meant to basically be a secret about where he was going to be cuz they don't want people to go whether it's disturb it or um loot it I don't, you know whatever want it didn't didn't want it to be this this big public thing so i had heard i'd heard some stories though like like that it is um you know, it was buried, and I heard that they maybe uh, even diverted a river to, like, flow over it and just totally redid the geography there to make it completely like, hidden over and hard to do. And then there were stories that basically they had ordered that everybody that was a participant in the burial and the, the process of doing that of where the location would be, there were orders that those people should be killed by some other people that wouldn't have known right? Some guards or something. So it's like the secret would die with it. Now, we don't know if exactly that's true, but that's one of the, um, the legends about it and why it still remains so secretly. <laughs> They're so secretive. So not crazy, but if we ever find it someday, that would be, that would be a big deal, but we just, they don't, they don't, they have no idea. The warfare from a messy tribal raiding system into an intercontinental affair fought on multiple fronts across thousands of miles. His battlefield techniques made the heavily armored knights of medieval Europe obsolete, oh, replacing yeah. them with disciplined cavalry moving in organized units. He made brilliant use of speed and surprise on the battlefield, and perfected siege warfare to such a degree that he ended the era of walled cities. Yeah. He taught his people not to fight anymore. not only across incredible distances, but to sustain their campaigns over years, decades, and eventually over three generations of constant fighting. His last ruling descendant remained in power in Uzbekistan until he was deposed by the rising tide of the Soviet Revolution in 1920. Genghis Khan mm -hmm. was also brutal. His goals were achieved through the deaths of Glad they're of balancing millions. him out for sure. The Mongols made no technological breakthroughs, founded no new religions, wrote no great books or dramas, and offered the world no new crafts sure. or methods of they agriculture. They facilitated it everywhere. They simply conquered and assimilated and their tactics left parts of the world depopulated to this day. Yeah. But the Mongols absolutely did change the world, and that was what young Temujin had desperately wanted from the very moment he first learned how harsh, violent, and unforgiving life could be. He eradicated torture, kidnapping, and raiding from his world, but at the cost of countless lives and entire cultures. Is peace bought with blood and maintained with force truly peace? It may be impossible to say whether Genghis Khan left the world better than he found it, <laughs> but it was still undeniably changed. Sure. I mean, they're, yeah, they didn't produce any of that stuff they were talking about, but they're a major reason why a, a, a lot of things got spread, right? Um, they're basically reasons how gunpowder made it way, its way to the West. Um, they took agricultural products in both directions. Um, that helps sustain populations. Um, like we said, I said earlier, they were such strong protectors of the trade routes that it enabled that. In fact, there's a, a period um, that historians call the Pax Mongolica, which is uh, in, in reference to the uh, Pax Romana of Rome, where it was like you had this with within the empire, not on the fringes where it's being conquered, but within the empire, there was so much stability and success happening. Um, that uh yeah it's kind of like a like a mongol golden age there but they are so important for spreading out ideas that eventually will lay the foundation for to be honest kind of the modern world as they were the great facilitators of history that way well i'm glad they didn't just go the route of just 
praising all those things that he did. I mean, they've talked about like they're saying, you know, he got rid of torture and raiding, but okay. But he's also you know, one of the murder, most murderous people ever, but I'm glad they at least provided some balance. I was wondering what they were going to do with that with such a polarizing figure. I don't know. You, I don't know how you can have the discussion about uh, Genghis without talking about the good and the bad. If you, I mean, if, and it's not hard to find things on both sides. It really is not hard to actually do. But yeah, um, okay, great. Well, I, I really liked this series. Um, I liked it more, I think I liked it more than the Catherine series um, that they did. Um, so that was good. That'll make me want to check out some of the other ones. I've had a, a ton of requests for um, other videos that they have done there. Now, I've also told... Um, and I'll probably do this next video. They have like a, it was like a, looked like Genghis Khan lies video. I guess they do that on a lot of theirs. Um, I just kind of seen that. So that I'll, I'll do that as a follow up after, after this. And hopefully they just, I don't know what they do with that. Maybe they go through just kind of the things that are, uh, that, people say about him that probably aren't true so that's great I, I love learning that stuff i love learning although sometimes it's sometimes it's sad depending on what the information is sometimes i like being told that a lot of things that i knew about something were wrong it's kind of enlightening that way to say oh yeah like this is you know this is what it was taught but it actually went this way and it's important to know the evidence for that but i think that's always important to always be challenging what you think you know about something because history i know history happened but we can learn more about it all the time. It's 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 a it's like a changing science. You know what I mean? Because if new evidence is out there, us as historians need to accept new evidence and go wherever the evidence um, takes us, rather than directing the evidence to conclusions we already want. All right. So um, yeah, thank you for watching. Um, just to plug a couple things here. Uh, if you liked if you've liked this series, um, make sure you go and visit those folks over at Extra History. There'll be a link to um, the video here that I watched that you can check that out. Um, a few other things going on just to just to put out there. Um, if you are someone that likes to talk history, um, I encourage you to lead leave. Uh, comments down below um if you'd like a little bit more of a community base i invite you to join the our discord channel that we have which is constantly full of histor historical discussions um there'll be a link to join the discord uh discord server in the um in the description a couple other things out there um a patreon just recently started just a few days ago and thank you to all the patreon pledgers there one of the benefits you get out of the, the patreon is um about once a week or so i will be doing a video or uh, watching a video that will be chosen through a poll on patreon so if you'd like to have maybe a little bit more influence on some of the stuff i get to do because otherwise I, I i do get just over flooded by youtube and discord recommendations um but to any pledgers of any uh, monetary value get to participate in uh, what will probably be about a weekly pulse to check out things um if you financially want to support the channel and my efforts, I'm um, working and, and uh, getting more original content out. A couple ways you can do that. One is the, the Patreon. Um, you can join us for live uh, the live premieres. Um, donate through YouTube, through their Super Chat system. You can do that. And then also um, there is uh, a new account that started with uh, Streamlabs that uh, you'll see links to that too. So if you wanted to do that, that's great, but um, never feel like that's that's necessary. So anyway, uh, thank you so much for being here. I definitely hope to see you more in the future. Hopefully we can keep making content that you would like to see. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and say goodbye here and hope to see you soon.